are listening to Off Planet Radio at offplanetradio.com. Good evening and welcome to Off Planet TV, Off Planet Radio. The websites are offplanetradio.com and offplanetmedia.net, where hopefully you are watching this show tonight. And uh, we have a good one lined up. It is uh, September the 23rd, 2015. And so far, we have not seen Armageddon. CERN has not blown out a mass of gluons and blown holes through nine dimensions and uh, unleashed the shag nasties from the other universe. We have not seen the banking failure. Jade Helm is not going live. And uh, all is right as rain tonight. It is the equinox. And that's what we're going to, I guess, in spirit celebrate because it's that, it's kind of that mystical time of year. Um, autumn to me is kind of the, like the veil it's uh, it parts a little bit and you lose that heat and that haze from summer and you kind of transition into um, this this very beautiful uh, well if you live in a temperate zone uh, time of color and change and shift before we go into the darkness of winter and so it is uh, it is a night worth celebrating as always because uh, well every day is another adventure my guest tonight um, as you will see on the screen Probably needs no introduction, but we'll give him one anyway because he is a legend in the world of uh, alternative internet media. He is probably one of the pioneers on YouTube in terms of presenting material that uh, de-encrypts. Is that a word? It is now. I just made it up. De-encrypts the occult. And um, he is the host of Freeman TV, and he has been at the forefront of conspiracy theory for nearly two decades. He created the first documentary on HARP and televised the first documentary on chemtrails. He's been honored by the Mayan shamans and blessed by the king of Bangalong. I'm going to have to ask you about that one. While enlightening the world on the occult aspects of Hollywood, technology, and politics with his TV show, The Freeman Perspective. Freeman is lectured around the world and he unveils the inner workings of secret societies such as the Freemasons and shows you the direction this world is going. Freeman starts where Alex Jones leaves off. Thank God somebody does. And in the spirit of David Icke and James Redfield, Freeman illustrates a world that is both cosmic and miraculous. He presents hope displayed in the creative spirit of humanity. Good evening and welcome, Freeman, to Off Planet TV. Uh, thank you so much, Randy. It is really cool to be here. It's awesome to have you on. We've, uh, we met before on, uh, on your turf. I guess what a couple of months ago, and um, had what I consider to be one of the one of my favorite interviews in terms of just getting together and riffing off of each other. And as it turned out, we really did have a lot in common, and a lot of uh, well, interesting insights into things from two perspectives. It, what, what was it you said to me? Uh, twin sons of different mothers, or something like that. Um, yeah. You know, it, it was weird how much commonality there is in terms of where we've been and the experiences we've had and um, even the backgrounds and the bloodlines, the things that um, we all know go into this whole continuum of strange experiences, whether it's UFOs or um, ritual cult happenings. Um, there is just a, a whole plethora of subjects. And, you know, I got to say, I, I look at the material you've covered over the years, Freeman, and it seems like you've been turning over rocks and finding things that are so interesting and so mysterious that, um, well, 
you know, a lot of what I'm going to do tonight in terms of an interview is basically let you riff on some things because I know you brought some things to the table. But tell, uh, for people who may not know, and for the record, tell us a little bit about how you got into alternative media, how you began doing what you're doing, and tell us a little bit about what you are doing and where you're doing it. All right. Well, uh, I, I, I always say that I never went looking for any of this information. It came hunting me. Yeah. And I don't know when it began or how, but at 10 years old, I was already getting into uh, the mysteries of planet Earth, the pyramids, the UFOs. And, uh, you know, I was always an investigator. I meant to grab. Can I grab something to show you? Yeah, yeah. Okay, give feel me five free. seconds. Yeah, less. No problem. I'll just do the talking head thing here. That's a nice background, by the way. Lots I meant to grab this before I came on. Now, this blew my mind, Randy. All right. Just talking about being 10 years old. This is a picture I drew when I was 10 years old. Now, what is so exciting about and mysterious about this image is that it shows galactic history. Now, I drew this in the fifth grade. It came out just before Star Wars. And what you see are the space shuttles. And on each of the space shuttles, I put a symbol. And I, I really wanted that symbol to be super cool. I wanted it to be something that just really was dramatic. Oh, look at that. That looks like, well, any number of things. Well, it Whoa. turns out 18 years later, I'm reading a book called The Serious Mystery by Robert K. Temple, all about the merfolk, right? <laughs> and what happens? They have a symbol for the star Sirius. I remember this. All right, now look again. On every one of those space shuttles, at the age of 10, I drew the Dogon symbol for Sirius. You see it there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. so yeah. in the middle of this, I thought I had drawn what was a, uh, a spiral galaxy. Now it turns out that that is an exact depiction of the craft that was filmed by the Columbia Space Shuttle in the tether experiment. You can literally superimpose the tether craft over this and the little notch is there. The hyperdimensional spirals are all there. And then this winged serpent that I have, I had no idea. So now this is connecting with the Syrians. This is connecting with the Alpha Draconans mm -hmm. and then whatever's going on in between with these craft that we see in the tether experiment. And I drew all of that at 10 years old. I would say that you were already beginning to channel your inner researcher even in those early days. That's, that's phenomenal. Isn't that, a, I mean. It, that's incredible. You know, it's interesting that you bring up, you know, the whole thing with Robert Temple and Sirius thing, because that was, that book came out at a time when I was, and I was a little bit older than you at that time. Uh, this would have been the 1980s. It actually came out six months before I drew that picture in 1977. Okay, that's when Temple's book came out. I found yeah. it in 1980. In 1980, I was trying to sniff out the whole UFO thing, which at that time, you know, you had whatever was in print. There were pulp magazines, there were books, but at that point in time, we were pre-internet. And Temple's book for me was like, that was the big moment. It was, you opened that up and you just went, finally, somebody with credibility is talking about this. Yeah. And that book opened up what became, well, the next 20 years of my life in terms of researching this and trying to understand, because let's face it, in those days, people did not talk about this openly like we do in this media. No. Uh, you were considered insane. Um, I remember doing a, a science project actually in eighth, ninth grade on UFOs. And in order to get this thing, by the way, it won second prize in earth science that year. Nice. But in order to get that science project vetted, I had to use the Air Force materials, which was Project Blue Book at that time, meaning that I took everything that I put into my own research, which was scant, and then I had to debunk it with the work that the Air Force put out because it was required that I put something in this 
there was a quote scholarly nature like yeah there was scholarly work on ufos in in uh, what was it 1970 uh you know th there just wasn't right and, and we're blessed now because we live in a time when this explosion took place when the internet opened up and i don't know when you began to find materials on the internet i was on usenet which was through a bbs service in what the early mid 80s maybe first computer late 80s probably bbs service using um uh unix to unix computer hookups and what was then the beginning of the internet but it was it was basically bulletin boards and usenet groups later mm -hmm. And the uh, the, U the Usenet groups were all Usenet dot something or other, and there was actually a group on there that was discussing UFOs and, and even oddly enough, abductions and contacts at that point in time. Right. And that was when people began to disclose. So we now live in a time when I, I think things have opened up enough, and this is kind of again, kind of going into the consciousness shift because it seems like. Um, the advent of the internet was also the advent of a time when things were beginning to open up. Um, the technology in some ways enabled us to be more free with the information we exchanged. We had unmoderated information for the first time. So that kind of goes into you and where you've been and what you've been doing because clearly you saw something in terms of a communication media that was going to allow you to put out materials that even when you began doing this and how long have you been doing what we would call quote alternative media on the internet well i actually started in the exact same chair as alex jones me and him at austin access i had a midnight show on sundays that lasted a half an hour and uh i really didn't know okay the the story though is that I was in Austin, Texas for South by Southwest, right? The big mm -hmm. music festival. And I met a homeless man on the bus who started doing my numerology. We became friends on the bus. He was an old man, uh, fuzzy white eye and greasy long hair. And uh, <laughs> we hit it off. And so uh, it turns out he was living in his van a few blocks from where I was living in my van. And he left a note on my van saying I needed to go to this meeting at the mall. So I follow his directions. I take all the buses. I go to this meeting at the mall and it's George Green, who is an ex Bilderberger, ex Jimmy yes. Carter's uh, financial advisor. And he's there talking about the Pajarans visiting Billy Meyer. Right? He's showing pictures of the craft and how the craft works, magnetic technologies. And then he starts showing pictures of the Pajarans themselves. And I kind of looked a little, you know, I got the long hair and the, uh, I looked the part and he really looked at me and said, well, sometimes the Plajarans will even sit in my lectures. So I took a cue and I began pretending to be an alien. And I started telling these people my conspiracy theories, you know, things like uh, shock and awe and how it relates to the, the heavenly mother and uh, you know, how I predicted 9-11 and, and what W really means. And all of this stuff started laying it on them and this guy walks up to me and says, you need a TV show. <laughs> and I was like, why, what are you talking about? And he's like, would you do it? Would you do it? I'll write you a check right now if you go and do this. And I'm like, man, I, I, I'm only here, you know, for the weekend. Well, I ended up living in Austin, Texas for five <laughs> years doing that TV show. I took his check and I went down there and I signed up. And then the World Wide Web came into fruition. Okay, like you were saying, yeah, we had AOL. That's what I remember. Is mm. AOL chats and I could empty one of those rooms in 10 minutes flat, right? Uh, you, you try to put any sensibility into the gibberish that's going on in the chat room and everybody just scatters like your cockroaches to light. But uh, so I began all the way back in those days, been met with, with computers back since the TRS-80 and you know, basic and all of that. Yeah. But uh, I got on this television show and I started producing these. I produced the Harp video, the Chemtrails video and the corporate logos and uh, the goddess Columbia. And then my roommate was uploading them to Google video when, when it was Google video at that mm -hmm. time. I had no idea this was going on. Another friend built a blog for my TV show and all of a sudden my TV shows were on a blog and everybody was watching it and I had no idea this was going on. 
And so I suddenly found out that I was an internet phenomenon. <laughs> and so I joined in and, and now I do all my own work, you know, I do all my own webmaster and video and everything you see on Freeman TV, I did. You know. It's, um, you, and you know, honestly, the catalog of work that you have there and, and the amount of material that you continue to put out, uh, it's a real workman eth ethic that you have towards this to be able to, uh, you probably know as well as I do, the burnout factor is kind of high yes. when you're doing this kind of media. I mean, you do have to step away from this from time to time because it's intense and the research is intense, the people are intense and there's a pull on the energy system. So. You know, to, to do this kind of work, you've, you've really asserted yourself in an area and kind of, I, I'm not blowing smoke here, you've distinguished yourself in a field that frankly needed that type of ethic because it, the problem with alternative media and it still exists is that there's a lot of dilettantes in the field. There's a lot of people who jump into it and they talk shit and they basically pull down the credibility of the, of the media rather than going in the direction of doing the intense consistent work that needs to be done so uh, you know kudos for that and kudos for the fact that you've done it with a plum and being able to to, you know, to do it at a high level artistically and and frankly even with with some scholarship in the course of doing all of this and and because you came at this obviously by the drawing that you showed us freeman um, I would say that you were, well, genetically predisposed or uh, destiny had kind of pointed you in this direction. There are no accidents in the universe. Um, gosh, I was going to ask the question now. I forgot what the question was. This happens a lot lately. Hey, Mercury's um, retrograde right it, now. So. You know, and, and I resist that. It's such an easy excuse when I could just say, gosh, I wish I hadn't smoked pot for all those years. <laughs> but <laughs> It's so true, though. All right. We're talking about genetic connections. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Let's go here. Here's my dad being raised to worshipful master in the Freemasonic Lodge. Now, this is in Kaiserschlatten uh, near Bavaria. And my dad, as a Freemason, ends up on killer submarine. Uh, like here's a Masonic Antarctica club, right? This is like uh, some bizarre Iceland, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, like the bizarre Masonic clubs that you can belong to. But so what happened was my dad ended up on killer, Submar killer one submarine with Jimmy Carter. Yeah. It's probably not gonna be able to see it in the light there, but that's Jimmy right there. Um, wow. And, and this is uh, you know, my dad on Killer One. So he's he's off in the first submarines. Now we know the submarines have a lot to do with the UFO society because uh, USOs, underwater you know, under right. submariner objects are really the first that were ever seen. It wasn't a flying object, but a sub submersible object and when you find that there's these connections with the Freemasons and then Project Blue Book and all of these government projects, I found something that I thought you might find intriguing, Randy. We talked about even the connections. So we got all these genetic connections. We have connections right. with secret societies to these. Well, you know, I didn't know my dad was chasing flying saucers for the government till I was in college, right? <laughs> but yet I was studying this stuff hardcore and he's telling me I'm crazy, right, all along. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, well, yeah, I was stationed on a South Sea Island. I had four radar dishes and whenever a flying saucer flies over, it's my job to call it in. And I'm like, wait a minute, you know, so you're telling me now that flying saucers are real. And he's like, absolutely, they're real. And I really, I got nothing else from the man. I went to get a, a, a firsthand interview from him once I started the television show. And this is a mystery, but the day I was supposed to show up, I, my flight was delayed, uh, he died. He did not wake up that day. And he knew I was coming to do this. So now we're getting into the realms of mind control and the possibilities, because my granddad was a Freemason as well. And I thought you might find this interesting. This is the Masonic Brotherhood of Maintenance for Way Employees. This oh, wow. is the, the Masonic certificate you get when you're a train conductor, engineer, and all of that, like your granddad was. Yeah, yeah. And my granddad. So both of our granddads, uh, 
I have these Masonic train connections. Okay, so you and I, you know, we went through that whole scenario where we found out, oh my God, this happened to you. This is your family. This is my family. <laughs> All of, and and we must have some genetic link to this. Well, it's, it's isn't it interesting um, that a lot of this comes into these, well, the submarines and then the railroad. For whatever reason, my my grandfather was at least thirty second degree because somewhere here. I have the Bible that's signed by all of the brothers in the lodge, which was inducting him into the 32nd degree. And uh, there are pictures and I can't find them. You're lucky, by the way, to have these documents because of so much of the, the things that the artifacts from my family got scattered or lost or misplaced. But I had a picture of my grandfather sitting at a table in Washington, D.C. with Harry S. Truman. Right. You know, my grandfather was management in the railroad. He started out as a uh, he started out as a worker. He worked his way up through the ranks in the union, and eventually, what they did was they would pull you into management, and they created a linchpin between the workers and management. Even though management at one level was no longer union, but they did that so that they had somebody who I guess what you would call them uh, basically a handler for the workers very important at that point in time because the railroads were the central form of transportation right up through World War II and you know after World War II as we went into the jet age obviously things began to transition away from railroading we moved into the era of planes and then of course commerce itself moved over into trucking and sort of supplanted the um, over the road type railroading that we, we, we saw up until that era but these guys were connected in very interesting ways, politically and socially. My grandparents were well known in their day as being very gregarious socialites who entertained people from all walks of life. Um, everything from artists and actors to prominent state assemblymen, prominent governors, politicians, local pro I mean, And I remember these people. I remember meeting them when I was young. So it, it's like a microcosm of how business gets done on that level. And then when you then when you scale this up, this is where, you know, I like to get the picture filled in because I'm going, OK, so it is a pyramidal structure on, on one level or another. These guys have clearly got fraternities. They've clearly got connections. These connections stream through all these institutions right up to government. So how high and how deep does it go? Did you ever get a sense of, you know, how well connected maybe your father, your grandfather were in terms of, uh, well, the branches that emanate out into the power structure? Uh, I never thought that he was very knowledgeable in the occult practices of Freemasonry. And when I began bringing some of these things to his, his attention, uh, you know, he was just like, oh, that's all a bunch of gobbledygook. I don't know anything about it. You know, and I'm like, but you ran the rituals and stuff. You know, what did you think you were doing? And um, no real answers there. So there are layers. And I now know many Freemasons and they get tapped into appendant bodies that you won't even know exists yeah. unless they want you. And then these are magical practices and magical orders. And you will even... Uh, often be recruited into the Ordo Templi Orientis, which is a Aleister Crowley sex cult magic order. And we really feel that that is the one order that is at the height of Hollywood. Now, when you start to look into what we're calling high profile rituals, mm -hmm. we began exposing these back with, well, even Janet Jackson with Justin Timberlake, uh, when she bared her breast and the wardrobe malfunction, right? Mm -hmm. Now that was a high profile ritual at the Super Bowl. So she bared her breast and it had a sundial or a, a golden sun on her nipple. Now the gold sun is the symbol of the male, the male got it. Right? And the female, the goddess form, it always has the breast bared. And you'll see Columbia, Justice, uh, Athena, you know, of uh, these uh, sort with that. So this was a hermaphroditic symbol that they were showing us in a high profile ritual using Mouseketeers. And so you start to get the connection of Hollywood, Walt Disney, the military, 
and into occult magic practices. So we've been uh, vetting these for years now, for a long time, uh, only, you know, getting to the point now where we've predicted what you would see in the high profile rituals. Now, one of the main studies that we got into was the Typhonian order of the OTO, the Ordo Templi Orientis, right? This magical order. Mm -hmm. The Typhonian order has a special kinship with communication with extraterrestrial beings through the use of ritual magic, sex magic. Mm -hmm. And the Typhonian order uh, calls upon the Lord of the Abyss, Typhon who's also known as Nodens and sometimes, uh, you know, Leviathan. Mm -hmm. And um, so we began digging into the Typhonian order and it's a very interesting study. Kenneth Grant was an accolade and a follower of Aleister Crowley took over the order and they have this symbol that they, they say is the mark of the beast. All right, so, I mean, I have it over here on my shelf, but uh, the mark of the beast, according to the satanic order of the Typhonian order of the OTO, right? And the, the magical proper that is invested in, in music and Hollywood is this OTO, is the X-Men logo. The X-Men logo, the X and the O, is the mark of the beast, according to Satanists. Okay, so uh, Rex Diabolus Church, who I've had on the show many times, uh, consider him a friend. He actually has the Mark of the Beast embedded in the back of his skull. I have it on video, you can watch it on my YouTube channel. Okay, the O and the X, that X-Men logo. Now, no one was talking about this, no one really is still talking about it because very few people have read the Typhonian magic, right? I haven't. No, yeah, haven't. yeah, yeah, and they're like 90 bucks, they just reproduced them all, you can get them now, Kenneth Grant. Uh, the Typhonian trilogy, I could show them to you later. Um, okay, so this Mark of the Beast, we, we, we clued in on this and we started talking about it before it was ever mass in, in consciousness. And really it was just the X-Men and the X-Files that I knew of at the time showing the Mark of the Beast. But as we began bringing this out to the surface, Madonna comes out in the Super Bowl and she does what she calls a 33 minute Kabbalistic sermon. She says Kabbalah is the original religion and she is a mass practitioner to the point that she goes to uh, cemeteries with rabbis and practices ceremonial magic around graves. Okay, that's Madonna, who also has a DNA cleanup crew, but that's another story, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so the mark of the beast that they show, Madonna showed that symbol, the O and the X, on the stage at the Super Bowl over and over and over again. Now this, is a satanic symbol that no one's familiar with, except for those that practice the magic, those that are initiated or those that study it, right? Like myself. And yet there it was over and over again. It became Russell Brand's mark of uh, Brand X. It became the uh, the corporate logo for Mac's new operating system, the OS. OS X, yeah. Uh, and over and over again, now you will see this all over the place. You'll see this O and X, and this is the Mark of the Beast in the Typhonian Order, whose real uh, pr purpose is communication with interdimensional beings utilizing sexual ritual magic. And the reason I bring this up a lot is because Madonna right now is preempting the Pope everywhere. She just had a major concert at uh, Washington, D.C., and uh, it was called the desecration of the mother and the fall, a rise of the fallen angels or something to that effect, right? Have you heard about her, her tour? This I did not hear. <laughs> okay, They're I'll, I'll have to look this. up the exact name again, but it's like desecration of, of uh, holy mother and the rise of the fallen angels. She's actually doing this in a concert? Really? Yeah, yeah, and she's wow. doing it everywhere right before the Pope comes. So I think it was September 13th to the 15th. Is this the Whore of Babylon thing? Is that what she's doing? Okay, okay. <laughs> so in order to show that our science was correct, that to look to the OTO for what we would see in high profile rituals, mm -hmm. Jamie and I, and Jamie is the author of Weird Stuff where we outline yes. this whole story so you can share it with your friends and everything else. Um, we outline this whole situation, we were asked, well, actually, I had Jamie on the show, and I asked her, you know, pr predict to me what we'll see from Katy Perry's performance at the Super Bowl. Come on, tell me you can do it. And we got into Jack Parsons and, and L. Ron Hubbard. Now, we got the Jack Parsons, L. Ron Hubbard, Aleister Crowley connection. Babylon. Yeah. Crowley died just months after the Roswell 
yes. incident, right? They were doing Babylon working, opening portals into the abyss, which is the place where Typhon lives. And then after opening these portals, we got flying saucers all over the place. But you know that now we're looking at Jack Parsons, the head of Jet Propulsion's laboratory, massive black magic practitioner, openly, you know, and the head of modern rocketry with Werner von Braun, the Nazi that yeah. came over, who was channeling entities using ritual magic with the Nazi SS, right? Um, but so, uh, what would Katy Perry do at the Super Bowl, and how does it relate to Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard, right? Scientology and OTO. Well, they had a vision of the Whore of Babylon, as you were mentioning. And in this vision of the Whore of Babylon, they saw her riding on a cat-like beast, holding the reins with a chalice of fire. And in looking at this symbol, it's the lust card in Aleister Crowley's tarot deck. We, Jamie's, Jamie laid out that vision of, Al, of uh, Jack Parsons and said, or L. Ron Hubbard, and said, this is what they're going to do with Katy Perry. They're going to present her as a horror Bible on riding on a cat-like beast holding the reins with fire. She came out, and I added to that prediction, and you can listen to all this on our website long before it ever happened. Um, I added, well, in, in the rituals of mind control, of trauma-based mind control, there are signs and symbols in that. And if you've never read this book, get it and read it how to create your own illuminati undetectable mind control slave by fritz springmeyer and cisco wheeler absolutely i okay. mean, I, I don't have that but i should My you God, must have good. this we, we we pull out of this all the time so in here you learn that the symbol for the high profile presidential model mind control slaves is diamonds so i said okay we're going to see diamonds in this mix as well because Katy Perry is currently the high profile, you know. Yeah. So she comes out on a cat-like beast that is diamond shape, wearing a flame dress, holding the reins exactly as the Whore of Babylon, exactly as we predict. This is vetting your science. This is taking it to the level that you can say, okay, look, I'm saying this consistently for 10 years, outlining the different profiles and rituals and how it relates to the magical practices of Freemasonry and the OTO and we can get to the point where we predict these events. And yes, it absolutely goes to the Horror of Babylon, and that's why Madonna always shows up in bright red, and she did the ritual to Pan, which is the hidden god, in her uh, Grammy Award, you know, at, right after ACDC, I had everybody go to hell. Um, <laughs> they did this whole, you know, Pan ritual, which now she's preempting the Pope. She's showing up in DC for Desecration of the Mother and the Rise of the Fallen Angels tour. And then in, let's see, tomorrow is it? So today the Pope is in. Hold on, I'm looking he's here. He's meeting with the president. Up. And he said the Quran was equal to the Bible today when he hung out with the president. And then he's going to, uh, from DC, he'll be going to New York. See that there, there's a, a, a night, I think it's an itinerary. This is from a YouTube video, but this is, can you see what I put up there? I can, yeah. Okay. So go ahead and, and just, because this Pope thing, there are no accidents with these people and they understand the number, numbers, the symbols, the dates, lining it up. I mean, the very time when his toe touches ground on America has some sort of hook into the supernatural with this guy, especially. Absolutely correct. Now he's a member of the Jesuits. Right. Yep. Uh, so it's been another high profile ritual magical mm -hmm. order. Uh, but yeah, and then you got Madonna doing these Kabbalistic rituals to Satan before the Pope shows up everywhere. And so she'll be playing in Philadelphia the day before, like I think tomorrow or the 25th, uh, the day before the Pope shows up there. Wow. And she's been doing all these high profile satanic rituals on stage in the Kabbalistic fashion and showing all of this stuff. So yeah, you can see the ley line, you can see the purpose and the point and that they have. Uh, so uh, now everybody has connected this to CERN as well. And I want to say that I have been following CERN from day one. I've been making amazing announcements about CERN following bizarre events like the, the Norway spiral, which I was actually covering that technology before it happened in Norway. It, 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 Norway wasn't the first spiral. I had already been covering this before it happened. Um, but so CERN had gone up to five TEV or seven TEV on the day Ob Obama went to Norway to get his Nobel Peace Prize for yeah. extraordinary efforts, right? 
and the Christian's newspaper said, aliens greet president for Nor in Norway. Um, I found this very intriguing programming and we'll get to that if you want. But um, CERN, everybody thinks is gonna be pumped up right now, 23, 25th, somewhere like that. But the, the 15 TEV, when they doubled the power of CERN, that actually happened in April. Uh, they just yeah. jumped ahead and went ahead and did it. They had announced they were gonna do it in September, but in April, they just said, eh, we did it. You know, they went ahead and punched the hole already. So all those fears can be assuaged now. You know, it's already happened. It was months and months ago and you didn't even know it happened. So uh, <laughs> for the public, don't worry. You know, all of these fears that are being put in is, is chicken little programming. And Walt Disney Co, who has been at the heart of this mind control for so long, will tell you openly in their Disney on the front lines on how this all works. They show you the fox teaching Chicken Little to spread fear through psychology and all the chickens end up getting eaten by the fox, you know? And so a lot of this alternative media that we're talking about, the fear porn, uh, that definitely is Chicken Little programming. The, the host doesn't even need to know he's doing it. He's just being fed the fear and then he's, you know, expounding on the fear and making it greater. And everybody's all freaked out about the end of the world this month. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, and quite honestly, I've watched what's been posted. And that's why when I opened tonight, I kind of was, you know, poking fun because here we are, the 23rd, and, well, it's the 23rd. But, again, the, the, the manifestation of these things is usually more so much more subtle than what we expect. Right. And it's almost like sleight of hand because it's like, look over here while something over there is going like this. So the question becomes, what really did happen? What's really going on that matters? And what was the diversion that, that they're playing us on? Yeah, what parts of it is social engineering? What yeah. part of it is the Chicken Little programming? Yeah. And so we have Jesuit priests running around now saying that aliens are our space brothers and didn't suffer original sin. Uh, the, the Pope himself is speaking about the Big Bang and bringing the year of light. CERN is also bringing the year of light for 2015. This is the Anno Lucius, which is the, uh, the calendar of Freemasonry, you know, the age of light. Mm -hmm. You see on Masonic cornerstones, you'll see the year 2015 is the year 6015 in AL, uh, Anno Lucius. So mm -hmm. that's the age of light in Freemasonry. You'll see it on all Freemasonic cornerstones. Um, so we are in this crazy period of, uh, I forgot where I was going. I got lost on the age of light thing. Uh, you had just asked me what? I forget too. <laughs> I mean, Mercury retrograde. Let me pull that back because, um, you know, there's so many little details in this scenario and we're there looking are, yeah. oh, social engineering is what we're looking at here. Yeah. And so you want to look at things like these Jesuit priests that are running around screaming high heaven that there is uh, extraterrestrial life and that we're going to meet them really soon and that they're not fallen beings like humans or earthlings are. And then you have a Jesuit Pope come in. You have a mysterious Pope, Pope Benedict Ratzinger, who was a Nazi youth from Bavaria, which I can't judge him too much on because my mom was a Nazi youth from Bavaria. So, you know, but, you know, Benedict, he was, he, <laughs> what a character. Oh my God. But he started investigating the Illuminati. He did a deep research into uh, the Illuminati and into the Vatican libraries. And after this was done, they shut the Vatican libraries forever. All Didn't right? they move them? Well, Wasn't 500 there... years it had been in operation. I don't know if they moved them. All I knew is they shut it down. I know cardinals were running from all over the world to get their last look at the documents before this place was locked up. Wow. And this was right after Benedict was digging into the Illuminati. And he came out with a 600-year-old misplaced document that exonerated the Knights Templar. Now, this is really bizarre. And this gets into the 1013 scenario. And uh, you know, ceremonial dates and numbers are important, too. And a lot of people have been trying to figure these things out. Uh, I do my best, and I've managed to predict 9-11, and I managed to predict 1013. Um, now, the reason... We're going to talk about that later, too. Yeah, okay. Well, so then Benedict comes forward and saying the Templars are exonerated for all the sexual heinous crimes that they were charged for back in 1307. And 1013 is the Friday the 13th that made Friday 
the 13th so unlucky the day they killed all the Knights Templar. Well, uh, you know, now we, now Benedict gives out and, and exonerates the Templars and the next thing you know, he quits, right? He's he's vetted the Illuminati. He's he's opened the the uh, Templars and then he quits and we get this Jesuit pope. And now you know, people should be a little bit freaked out about that, but no one, I, when I started this scenario, I thought everybody knew all the presidents were Masons. You know, I thought people knew the District of Columbia was based out of Freemasonry. Mm -hmm. These were things that I thought were common knowledge. And so I began to understand later that people didn't know this until, you know, Nicolas Cage came out with National Treasure. And of course that's Disney again. Um, but so, yeah, uh, these these signs and scenarios all play into this puzzle, and they are performing these rituals at specific times, dates, and and how it all. Happens. Well, even uh, the resignation, oh, social engineering, yeah, the social engineering thing. But I, you know, again, the resignation of Ratzinger was interesting because that occurred, and then lightning strike in right. the Vatican. Remember yeah, that's that? Right. Yeah, yeah, and then the, the bird of prey took out the dove. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah you know there there is i don't look at any of this and go well that's just an amazing coincidence because i think we well, got what about the the crane with bin laden on it falling on the uh mecca you know killing hundreds it's... of people yeah. on 9 11. yeah you see we, we just uh, you after a while the good student of this goes okay there are deeper things here that i need to understand because this is not woo woo this is actually the way things run. Right. And this was even going back to talking, you know, about our fathers and our grandfathers and, and what were they involved with? What did they know? Because they weren't going to talk about it. But you begin to uncover even the synchronicities in your own day to day life, which is yeah. a lot of what I do. I just pay attention to what's going on around me. And you begin to notice this stuff as it unfolds. And that's magic on a personal scale we're talking about people who have the mojo to be able to work much like um what what crowley and parsons did at palomar with the you know attempting to bring the moon child up was these guys are creating uh, a supernatural theater that is harnessing powers and navigating through all of these events that we live in everything from the JFK assassination, the moon landing, you know, you just riff through history as we remember it so far. And you can see the numbers stack up. You see the events, you watch the murky characters. None of this is by accident. Right. Absolutely. There's a lot of bizarre things that occur and, and uh, it just, it gets skipped over a lot of times because people don't have a place for it to hang her in their closet or anything to put that data there was a very interesting event that happened back in 99, just prior to Y2K. And I was one of the, I was actually working at Kansas University at that time as a cook. And uh, I was serving uh, lawyers and engineers. And while I served them, I was serving them information, intel, you know, all the stuff I'd uh, printed off from the internet, teaching them about HARP and all this mm -hmm. stuff. And, you know, they would always say to me, oh, you know, you can't believe what you read on the internet. And I, you know, that, then the headline reads, uh, Milosevic accuses US of using harp technologies to cause earthquakes and floods in the Middle East. And that was the byline on USA Today, the newspaper sitting out there at the university. And so I would say, well, look, you know, here, here it is in the news. And, you know, you, you guys know, you know, do you know Milosevic accused the US of harp, harp you know, war? creating earthquakes and floods and they said oh well he's just saying that you know now they're they're like Milosevic just you know what does he know and I'm like oh my god how much what do I have to bring you to make this happen make you understand what's going on that they have godlike powers and we can really not judge uh where the warfare is occurring now now there was another mystery in 99 because they were setting up this whole luciferian ritual the y2k celebration mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was my very first film. I tracked the entire scenario of the Luciferian connections from, you know, they burnt the River Thames at the speed of the sun. Uh, this is a Luciferian connection. They put the, uh, the uh, eye, uh, the big Ferris wheel on London, and they put the Millennial Dome across mm -hmm. from Big Ben. 
to make the hermaphroditic magical connection. Something Washington DC always had the dome and the obelisk and, and the hermaphroditic symbols. The reflecting pool on the, yeah, the whole yeah. thing. And yeah, and then uh, they made the sun rise in the West in the Y2K ritual as, as Bill Clinton was speaking, saying it is a rising sun, giving the code word saying our children are ready. And then they made the sun rise in the West. This is a sign of Horus, the age of Horus and Lucifer. So uh, you would look at this whole scenario. Now, one of the, the key ingredients for the Y2K celebration was going to be the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. I remember this, yeah. And you know, when people were talking about the Y2K meltdown, I was like, God, please happen. You know, if all the banks crash, good for you. You know, I'm ready. Bring down the computers. Let's start over. Uh, so I was very, you know, positive about the, the Y2K, but I never thought it was going to happen. You know, the Y2K thing was another chicken little scenario. It had been known about since 1974. People were working on it, but now realize with the Y2K bug that they were charging $10 per line to fix this thing. And the DOD alone had 500 million lines of code at $10 a piece, right? That was just one part of the DOD. Right, so you're talking about a total bank out that occurred for Y2K. But I was concerned about the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. I'm like, look at the dollar bill, you know, Anno Coeptas, we're looking at Novo Ordo Seclorum, you know, the New World Order, capping of the Great Pyramid, the completion of this project. And uh, people were like, you're crazy, what are you talking about? And so they, they set it up and there, there was this mystery. There was a, a jetliner that left out of LAX and stopped at uh, Patterson Air Force Base. Now, Patterson has never had a passenger liner, a public liner, most or less an Egyptian passenger liner land at it ever before or since, right? Never. They landed, they picked up 30, 33 Egyptian military at the base and a jet propulsion laboratory scientist. This is all in the news. And they flew from, uh, from Patterson Base to uh, LaGuardia to begin their trip to the Great Pyramid prior to the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold. I vaguely remember some of this. Now. The plane suddenly, okay, the, the flight, so you can check this out for yourself, the flight number is Egyptian Flight 990, and they had Horus on the tail of the, of the, the plane. And Egyptian Flight 990 takes off from uh, LaGuardia, suddenly takes a nosedive, the pilot seems to get control of it again, takes another nosedive and crashes into the ocean, killing everyone. Now, as this plane went down, the public pilot called out a Muslim prayer. And at that time, they were not ready for terrorist programming. 9-11 hadn't occurred yet. It was all Y2K scare. And it was FEMA and DOD that were telling everybody to prepare for the Y2K, right? That's where all that information came from. It wasn't a crazy conspiracy theorist. You know, it was FEMA and DOD telling everybody to prepare. Well, that, that flight crashed into the ocean. They called it pilot suicide. And then the, y, the capping of the Great Pyramid with gold was canceled, right? So you got Jet Propulsion Laboratories, 33 Egyptian militaries, mysterious flight crashing into the ocean. The entire celebration gets canceled, or at least the capping part. Uh, really bizarre scenarios going on. And, and this makes me think of Clock Boy. Right, so we have a Muslim crashing a plane into the ocean, killing all these military and jet propulsion scientists. Nobody cries terrorist. Nobody says, oh my God, you know, this is the Muslims coming to get us. But Clock Boy, do you know what I'm talking about? I forgot his, his name. The boy who brought a clock in a pencil box to school. That's, yeah, 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 the, the, yeah. Now, President Obama's saying, wow, well, that clock is really cool. Why don't you bring it to the White House? Now, can you imagine me walking into the White House with this wired clock ticking in a box <laughs> and say, hey, the president told me I could bring this to you. You know, they'd have me in cuffs and, and hauled off in no time flat. But MIT's giving this kid, uh, you know, bringing him in, showing him around. Uh, Intel's giving him all these project uh, products and stuff. And, um, you know, there's been children who have been suspended for drawing penciled guns, for carving oh guns God. out of Pop-Tarts. Yeah. They get suspended. This kid gets a tweet from the president and it's this social engineering, this psychological warfare, uh, you know, whoa, whoa, you, you just, you know, you don't want Muslims running around with uh, strange bomb-like objects, you know, what's wrong with you? You don't want diversity? 
And, uh, you know, so when you look at the puzzle and you find out that this kid actually didn't even create the clock, he just didn't create it. No, he just basically took a clock apart and put it in a briefcase. Yeah. And for this, he's being touted as brilliant. MIT and, and Harvard want him want him to come up and co- they, they they want him to go into theoretical physics yeah 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 i mean you're going social what? engineering and and so what news cycle got aborted for this story that was that was a question i kept asking that's another thing yeah is how we get redirected into these fabricated trivial stories while in the background something really is going on so i'm always looking at the news that isn't the news because i'm thinking they're running some sort of caper right now man you can see some amazing stuff on c-span i used to be an avid avid c-span watcher i remember when Ra l showed up before congress to talk about human cloning yes. puppy white yes. suit. you know and i'm like what is this oh my god and I mean, this was Congress, you know, <laughs> and this guy in his puffy white spacesuit saying, well, of course we are going to clone. We are cloning now, but we can't talk about it. And Bridget Boussoulet was there, the head of Clone Aid. And she's like, well, we've already cloned, you know, 12 people. So, uh, you know, but no, I can't tell you who they are. And, you know, this was 2000, 1999. It was, yeah, that was around 2000. Yeah, yeah I think it was actually December 25th, 2000. Uh, that they announced the birth of Eve, the first baby clone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, that we we thought it was a big deal that they 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 did Dolly the sheep. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, which which well, he didn't. Ian Wilmot, he didn't he didn't think Dolly was any big deal at all. No, not at all. <laughs> he was like, right, nah. you know, I didn't. He didn't even know where the the cell came from. The utter cell that made Dolly. He didn't know who the mother was. He didn't care. He didn't expect to be on the cover of Time magazine. There actually was no money in cloning. He was trying. Uh, one part he was working on cloning cows because there's some money in that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you get a prize bowl and you can clone it endlessly. But he was actually generating a sheep that would produce pharmaceuticals out of its milk to help fe- hemophiliacs. Right. Uh, that's what a Dolly was. She was a pharmaceutical production machine that they had genetically crafted. And when he got all this attention, he was completely shocked because there was no money in cloning. Now, what just recently happened is Obama came forward and released all restrictions on federal funding for stem cell research, which is a coded word for we now fund human cloning. Yeah. But he made a note. He said, now human cloning for reproduction will not be tolerated in any country. This is Barack Obama's words. Wink, wink. Uh, yeah, but human cloning for reproduction is what he said. Human cloning for experimentation, that's okay. We're going to fund the hell out of that. And so they are. I mean, we've got glow-in-the-dark sheep, glow-in-the-dark chickens and cats. We're, you know, crossing humans. There's uh, at least 30 stem cell projects seeking immortality on the International Space Station right now. Uh, You know, this is happening. Michael Jackson's going to be cloned by Clone Aid. John John Lennon's going to be cloned by some dentist in Canada. Uh, Madonna has a cleanup crew running around making sure and, nobody and clones her. Whatever happened to the frozen head of Walt Disney? Oh, yeah. Question I want to ask. I mean, you know, you go back in time, none of this is new. Right. Uh, humans have been, uh, ex- what was it, Alcor, the company that was doing the original cryogenics things back in the in the 80s. Um, we're not even talking about life extension technologies. We're talking about a biological immortality, I guess, or being able to ultimately dump human consciousness into some surrogate vessel, which goes right. into the whole go- golem thing, uh, <clears throat> goes back, well, the whole Kabbalistic concepts of, of, the, of the golem. Absolutely. Which, is, which, you know, everywhere you look, everything cycles right back around again you know that's what babylon rising essentially is that's what um the moon child experiment is feel free to pull one down and show yeah i'm just like right. everything you say <laughs> it, it, that's that's fine because this is spontaneous i'm thinking golem. yeah yeah <laughs> golem yeah oh yeah yeah um because people yeah i really need to realize that this is this is all you know I have a book on magic 
and it's, it's this incredible <laughs> library that you have there. you know but this is the complete system of the golden dawn and you know this is how thick it is folks this is a study of magic and and this is just one book one study one you know and it is deep, it is thick, and it is a serious study that these people absolutely, and you would think with all this time, thousands of years, all of the greatest minds have turned their minds to the occult, you, you have to accept that this is something. There's a reason they put the street plans in pentagrams in DC. Yeah. There's a reason Astana is a seal of Solomon to call upon demons, you know. The, uh... The depth of this thing, when you get into it, um, the amount of time that it takes to even go through. I mean, look, I spent nearly <laughs> 20 years just studying the Bible, which is a far deeper book than the surface level Christians understand because it's encoded too. But to go through and read these ancient texts and to understand them, this, this is a lifetime pursuit for people. I mean, you never get it you know? you're not going to get there yeah because it's all encoded and there are keys to being able to understand this and speaking of keys you were talking in the interview that the first time that we talked together talking about um jj her and the keys to enoch i mean now that's a book i picked up when i was in high school i understood nothing about this book. <laughs> no <laughs> but I was intrigued by it. I was intrigued by the concepts he was putting out. And this was, I guess, on the, the very spur of what we now call New Age. It was, you know, it was alternative religion, alternative spirituality, not very well accepted in the Western world at all. But if you look at that work and where it went and where J.J. Hurtock went in, in promulgating all of this, we started to see an opening as we edged out of the 20th century into a wider, do I want to say audience or marketplace for this alternative spirituality where people became interested in it and were less and less fearful of it. Part of what you do is you've kind of, you've kind of immersed yourself in things that, you know, as a kid, I was told you don't read this. You don't look at that. The forbidden, the lost books of the Bible, you know, to ask questions about, well, well, well what's, this, what's this gospel of, of uh, Thomas? You know, that's mild compared to the gospel of Judas <laughs> or, you know, the, uh, the Apocrypha, the Archons or any of the other books. But this is forbidden knowledge. This was forbidden for the unwashed. And it's all been glossed over and it's all been shaded in a way that has discouraged people from actively pursuing it. You kind of don't have that fear. You kind of are drawn to this, including the dark stuff. Is there a danger when you immerse yourself in, in this? I mean, do you have to do protection in order to constantly be immersed in this? I think so. I think uh, you really got to keep a light heart. Uh, yeah. That's critical. Uh, but I've had my meltdowns. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the topics and some of the things that we look into are far darker than I had, you know, you don't expect. You get into trauma based mind control and ritual murder, high profile murders, uh, and all of that. And it really gets frightening. It, it does, because you learn along the way that there is a controlling force that's even embedded in the uh, police and the uh, courts and that if they want you and there's no getting out you know they they will take you and put you in a in a sanatorium and and lock you away and drug you up and you see this happen to these people over and over again another frightening part about trauma based mind control was that none of the victims ever knew that it had happened to them and that was always bizarre. How could this be? Well, when you study how heinous this really is. Now, if you want to get an understanding of what trauma-based mind control really entails, the movie The Butterfly Effect actually mm -hmm. follows Fritz Springmeier's book that I showed you word for word. Yeah. Uh, and they must have had a deep knowledge of trauma-based mind control, MK Ultra, and Project Monarch in order to make that film. And of course, uh, you were speaking of the Moonchild, 
And the second title to the Moonchild of Crowley is The Butterfly Net. Uh, and so oh. we're looking into it. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, that whole but concept. Crowley himself, uh, and I got to admit that I have a revulsion level with Crowley. Yeah, he probably should. Uh, you, you know, you, you look at this and you realize he was tapping into this for a long time. And then additionally, he was British intelligence. And isn't it funny? And I, we're coming up on a break here, so I'll kind of shorten this. Isn't it funny how we scratch the surface of um, occult knowledge and we find all of these operators inside of intelligence operations? The intelligence operations, Mossad, CIA, MI5, MI6, name one, pick one. It looks to me like they're one gigantic inner circle of the occult. Yeah, never forget the CIA came out of skull and bones. Yeah. I mean, these people are practicing rituals in coffins, calling out their sexual, uh, you know, adventures and uh, screaming holy bloody murder. If you've seen any of the skull and bone rituals that have been, you know, exposed on the internet, so yeah, never forget that they, they are not just a simple agency that are off, you know, saving the world like uh, Alias, you know, <laughs> Jennifer Garner. Yeah. Uh, there is a deep, deep seated mystery in here. Yeah, I think that's actually what the X-Files was trying to tell us in some ways, too. Let's take a break here, uh, leg stretch, um, whatever the beverage of choice is, and just refresh for a few minutes. And we'll come back on the other side, probably about six or seven minutes. We'll be back with part two of our interview with our friend Freeman. We'll be back on the other side of Off Planet TV. Stay tuned. And we are back on Off Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins, um, and we're gonna we're gonna spin into the second hour here with Freeman. Uh, a couple of show notes: next week's show will be merged with Roger Landry and the Liberty Beacon Project. We are going to do a three-hour special edition, merged, and um, the project is basically designed around unifying some of the leaders of the alternative media movement. Um, for a number of months now in the background, we've been talking about the fact that the movement's fragmented and we're not effective because as we're not one voice, we're not one people right now. Uh, basically, we're gonna call out a lot of people that are running power trips. We're gonna attempt to find the people that are real leaders. And as Roger Landry likes to say, a leader is known by the people he stands behind, not the group crowd in front of whom he stance i really formed that sentence badly but you get my point so next week that'll be three hours starting at 7 30 p.m eastern standard time here in the u.s um use the world time clock as a converter the rest of the world because quite frankly i can't deal with time zones anymore it, we're going to go back oh we're going back on to eastern time when that happens, this show will probably also change as well. And then coming up the following week in October, I don't have a calendar in front of me right now. Uh, Quantum healer Chris Kaler will be here. We're going to do on the air healing sessions with Chris. This is an opportunity to come on the air and um, uh, be diagnosed by Chris, who is an astonishing healer. Um, he really deals uh, with deep stuff, as you well know, Chris is dealing not only with just the normal maladies of humanity, but in fact, alien infections as well. And that'll be a riveting show. So that's coming up in October next week, Merge Show with the Liberty Beacon Project. And we welcome back Freeman for the second hour. Welcome back, my friend. Hey, it's, just, it's really good to be here, Randy. It's a wild I, ride. It's I, I love this setup you got. This is, uh, well, this is really fun because we get a chance to riff. Any one of these um, subjects that we've touched on tonight are so exhaustive that all we can do is glance at them. And I would suggest that um, viewers, listeners, um, avail yourself of the information that can be found. Freeman, 
tell people where they, they can find you, where they can find their materials, what you're, what you're doing and how you're doing it. All right. Well, free man TV, free man TV is the website.com and uh, 10 years. I, I consider it a work of art. Honestly, I, I work very hard on freedom.com. Yes. And I mean, it is, is engineered to be a one-stop shop for all your conspiracy needs. <laughs> really. Uh, you know, it's got all the links on the side for everyone else. Uh, 10 years of linking things in there too. So everyone that's ever been in this industry, I think has been linked to my website in some way, shape or form. There's no such thing as an old show. Uh, I think no. people still don't know uh, most of the things that I talk about. Um, and so I recommend starting back at the beginning, but go to freemantv.com and there's just a plethora of stuff to go through. I, I, I keep weird videos, keeping up to date on whatever's going on. Uh, I keep, uh, you know, consistent shows every Saturday night at 8 PM. We are, we're putting out another show and uh, you know, a lot of videos, a lot of full video productions that have taken a lot of time and uh, they're, you know, they're mind blowing. It's mind boggling. And I'm amazed and, and just excited about it all the time. And, you know, I, I've signed up for another 10 years of freemantv.com. So, yeah. You know, let's see where we go. You know, that was the thing when I was on the Access show. I was, I was like, how, how am I going to do another season? How am I possibly? I remember when I couldn't cut out 15 minutes on the air, you know, <laughs> that very first time I put myself in front of the camera all alone in a room. And I'm like, uh, hi world, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and didn't know what to do or say. Now, now six hours isn't enough for me to tell you what I've, uh, you know, all the knowledge that I've been trying to share. And you're right. It is an art. I mean, what we do, I mean, you're like me in the sense that this is all hand rolled. I mean, we're doing the artwork, we're doing the production, we're putting up the websites, we're putting code in behind it. Um, we're basically self producers for the most part. And a lot of people don't understand that, that this is viewed as an art. This is viewed as something that we do as an act of love. The creative impulse, again, I love that in your bio because it's something I just talked about on a podcast that I did with my uh, co-host Chris Holly last night uh, about the fact that this is what makes us distinctly human. The creative impulse that arises out of the human spirit is something that AI can't do. And it's one of the hopes that we have in, in, in this technological era, to quote Svignu Brzezinski, is that I don't think we can create algorithms that can plumb the human spirit. So the singularity in one sense to me is almost moot, but it is still a scary prospect. In the landscape of things, and I know you've touched on the subject, I know that you've dealt with it, AI, transhumanism, this whole plethora of things that's attempting to merge the human biology with machines. Give us the Freeman perspective on where you think that is and where it's going. Yeah, it's a lot farther than people realize, that's for sure. I mean, we even have a transhumanist presidential candidate this year. <laughs> I mean, you know, what Zoltan Istvond, I mean, come on. Uh, he's from California, but with a name like Zoltan, you know, you're just like, <laughs> And of course, he used to write fear porn novels of, uh, you know, transhumanism. Now he's a transhumanist candidate. It's really bizarre. But um, so that's, you know, that's the beginning of how far it is coming. And uh, there was something I wanted to say, but uh, I'll go I'll go into the story. You know, it's like these, these things that just come across always. Anyway, uh, so as we start to look at this puzzle of what's coming down the pipe and, and who's doing it and what their goals and agendas are and then you start to see why these things are occurring. Um, so we talked about the Vatican and the Jesuits that are running around saying that these aliens are our space brothers. At the same time, they've started announcing alien ambassadors around the globe. You know, there's uh, uh, Maslin Offman is the, the UN uh, alien ambassador, the head of outer space affairs at the UN, right? Uh, we have uh, Linda Rothschild, who is the alien ambassador for NASA. So now we've got these guys and they're all meeting at the Royal Society and uh, they are having, they had a major conference on what we will do when, he, when we contact ET. And, and many of the people in this troop were very interesting. Now there was a picture of Hillary Clinton running around meeting with a Rockefeller and she was carrying the book, Are We Alone by Paul Davies. 
you can see that picture online and it's just kind of a weird like you know why was she carrying this book why was the photo op and all of that but uh this book is all about extraterrestrials and paul davies was also one of the people that showed up at that uh, royal society conference but then also mark uh oh good god uh <laughs> All right, his name will come back in a second. The the head of uh, the Blue Brain Project. Now, I find this very intriguing. We got Blue Beam, Blue Book, Blue Brain. Blue uh, Avians. Blue. David, they have the whole David Wilcock thing with Corey, Corey Good. And this, oh, yeah. you, you heard this, this, this riff about the Blue Avians? I um, have not. I only made it through the first video on that. Okay, yeah. Uh, um, but. Secret Space Program, the Blue Avians. That's actually Project Bluebird, CIA. And there's operation. Bluebird. Yeah, Bluebird. yeah, exactly. So he's coded. Uh, Blue Blue Brain is actually Henry Markram is his name, and he is the head of the Blue Brain Project, which is the mind transfer technology. He is trying to create a mammalian brain inside of the computer. Oh, I remember what I was going to ask you is, have you seen that Google AI art? Yes, I did. Yes. So disturbing. Yeah, it's very disturbing. Now, this is something yeah. that keeps occurring. The very first AI that they put out there to write novels kept writing uh, graphic, violent novels. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, you know, the first article I ever saw in AI of that is AI evil. And, and it was because they, they couldn't get this computer to write anything but slasher work. <laughs> and then they've got this uh, computer putting out these artworks and they are they are just demonic you know they're really yeah. like just i don't know they're, they're not only demonic uh, they're repulsive i mean you know it they, they included uh, computerized anal sex and i mean the whole bit i look i went through this and after a while i was like this is um uh, well it was repulsive it was crazy, yeah. yeah. So we're finding that evil AI, AI is, is, seems to be evil, and then they're cloning. Now, cloning's been going on for a long time, right? You know, if you believe it, the Nazis were doing it. Yes. When you look into it, you find out it's not that hard of a process. The very first clone of an amphibian, of a frog, was made with a baby hair and handmade tools. Okay, so the very first clone was actually just done by a scientist, you know, with all his own homemade, and he plucked the hair off his baby's head and... and created you know splice the, the cell and mm -hmm. there you go uh so cloning well, it hasn't been that that big of a deal but the you know here's the curious one is they cloned a brahma bull and uh the the bull was named chance and the clone was called second chance and uh just giving you these so that you could look it up but uh Second Chance, the clone of Chance. Now, they, they wanted to clone this Brahma bull because he was a pet of the family. This, this massive 2,000-pound bull would lay down with the family. He'd lay in the yard with them, play with them and stuff, right? So he cloned Chance, and he brought him back. And Second Chance was friggin' evil. <laughs> Second Chance gored this guy with his horns. He ripped his scrotum open. He was, I mean, Second Chance took every chance he could to just, like, kill this guy. And you can see you can see videos of, of Chance and Second Chance, and, and he's got these black evil eyes. I mean, it's really bizarre. Now, when you're looking into human cloning and cloning in general, the big difference, the key element here is electricity. All right. Now we might get to Luciferian connections and electricity. I'm not sure, but electricity also plays a heavy role in Blue Beam in the idea of transmitting demons into your soul. That's what Bluebeam was all talking about. People talk about this false invasion. That's not what Bluebeam was about. It was about channeling demons into your soul, utilizing electronics and fiber optics. Go look at it again. You know, that's what Bluebeam was, not fake alien invasion. That was just part of it. Um, so now we're looking at these clones, and they're all coming back evil. The big difference between a clone and a natural birth is the electric charge that they stimulate the egg with to tell it it's alive. Now that is a charge that the mother gives to the egg, that it you know stimulates its uh, production and splitting. Uh, but yet with cloning, you're looking at a false uh, injected electronic jolt of life into the cell, and I think that's a big difference between the scenario. What 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 I see you drawing connections to here is that all of this so-called transhumanism is really a means to bring alien consciousness into human biology. Am, am I 
The more infinity. you look, the more that's what it looks like. Yeah, that's as what it looks crazy like. Crazy as it is, when yeah. you find out how many of the elite and how many of our leaders and people in, in powers uh, are channeling entities, there was the channeling of the nine, the mm-hmm. NEA. Yes, yeah, and exactly. Mm-hmm. You've got the Asters and all these other uh, high profile, fi- even Gene Roddenberry showing up to channel. Roddenberry was with the nine. Uh, Uri Geller was part of that. Uri Geller was the channel for the nine. Yes, and he, he actually yeah. came back saying, well, the nine aren't actually gods. They're actually a, a AI computer orbiting the planet in a spacecraft known as Spectra. Yes. Now, Uri Geller, now he was the guy, the Israeli psychic who could bend keys with his mind and he became famous. But he was actually an intelligence asset. Wasn't it? Yes. All of these guys. And he was running around with Michael Jackson seeking immortality. Now, Uri and Michael, they went and they, uh, they hired a roboticist to, to transmit Michael Jackson's soul into a robot known as A-Rock. You can watch a movie called Home Movie where the roboticist tells the story of how Michael Jackson asked him to build the robot for his soul. But obviously Michael can't dance in a robot soul, so uh, he turned to cloning and he actually went to Clone Aid. He met with Bridget Bruce Lee. Now you can go to the front page of Clone Aid right now, cloneaid.org, and you'll see they're all excited because they're gonna clone Michael Jackson. Um, but then you kind of get into the potential of time travel. Now, I interviewed Dr. David Lewis Anderson, who, who yes. seemed to be the head of the you know, Anderson Institute of Anderson Time Anderson, Time yes. Time Technologies. Mm-hmm. I think I had the last interview with him before he went black. He disappeared, yeah. He told me on the air that he was going to do so once they got this going. I had him to fully describe the, uh, the, the, how time travel occurs, how, uh, what it's like to be in that. And so I have that all on, the, you know, on FreemanTV.com if you want to check it out. Just Google Michael Jackson and time travel and you'll get this whole story. Um, now, what's really mystery is that he told me that they can't control time travel in Saudi Arabia, that they have time control technologies, that they can shut down time travel, but for some reason they can't seem to control Saudi Arabia from time travel. Well, Michael Jackson, when he died, was 500000 in debt to a Saudi prince, and no one could figure this out. It was all over the news. They were like, why is he in debt? Why is it to this guy? No one knew. Now, Michael Jackson, uh, I'll give you this story. He, he was running around with Uri Geller, trying to buy a robot, tried to buy a clone, and then he went and bought a replica, a life-size replica of King Tut's sarcophagus, the golden sarcophagus. And you can watch this on film as well. There was a day uh, a guy followed Michael Jackson around and, and filmed him all over. And Michael is standing there looking at the King Tut's sarcophagus, and the documentarian says, are you going to be buried in this? And Michael says, no, I'm going to live forever. And, and the guy's like, okay. Well, a month after Michael Jackson's death, uh, now let me just say, you can see Michael Jackson climbing out of the back of the coroner's vehicle after it shows up at the hospital. I have all these videos in my weird video collection. Uh, you can see Michael Jackson yeah. shadow going around when CNN's reporting he's dead and all this stuff in his house. You know, uh, he wasn't dead. Well, anyway, next thing we know, a month later, everyone in the Chicago that went to the museum suddenly notices a bust of Michael Jackson from Akhenaten's Egypt, and it's Michael Jackson to a T. I mean, you got to see it for yourself. Go look at the ancient Michael Jackson bust at the Chicago Museum, and it's Michael Jackson. I mean, nose missing, uh, you know, the whole thing, his face as it was when he vanished. And that Michael Jackson that came out to the O2 arena announced the the O2 thing, that wasn't Michael Jackson. Go watch it again. Tell me that was Michael. That was not Michael, it was a duplicate, right? So here's Michael into all of this stuff. Next thing we know, he's going back to Akhenaten's Egypt with King Tut's golden sarcophagus, right? So now we know for a fact that they can clone mummies, all right? I know the cloning mummy thing, but I gotta go there, Randy. Go there. All right, I mean- Jump the shark, jump, go for it. I have a look, a 1985 Nature Magazine. Now, Nature Magazine is a prestigious scientific peer-reviewed magazine. It's not Flight of Fancy, it's not Time Warner, it is science. They announced 1985 that they had cloned a mummy. This mummy was cloned from the period of Akhenaten. It was 2,500 years old. And mummification saves a cell viable for human cloning. This is something that Michael Jackson did for with Clone Aid. This is something that John Lennon did with his tooth. But to, to survive 2,000 years, you have to be mummified. We do not know how to mummy, mummify. Okay, Stalin, 
and uh, was mummified and is rotting. Lenin was mummified and rotting. Uh, we can't do it. We don't know what it is. We don't know the mystery of the Egyptian mummification. It was a huge process followed by Anubis. Now, speaking of Anubis, as soon as Obama was coming around, Anubis went everywhere as well. And he is the god of the underworld that opens the portal to allow you into the underworld. And he was showing up with King Tut and uh, actually Akhenaten and Queen T's stuff all over the world as Obama was being heralded. So why would I say this? Um, when we find out that absolutely we can clone a mummy, scientifically vetted, it has happened. It happened in the 80s, folks. Okay, 1985. You can look it up. Science Magazine, Nature, or even New York Times reported on it. I um, remember... I had completely forgotten about that. I know yeah. these things, right? They just go oh and they God, go through. Yeah. And uh, this one clicked with me. I, I immediately clued in on that one. And I started, I mean, my third television show, long before Obama had ever been on, you know, radar, ever heard of this guy, I was talking about cloning a mummies. My third television show, Return of the Nephilim, because I had remembered this article. I got everything wrong when I was saying it on the air because there was no World Wide Web when I started the television show. I couldn't go Google it. There was no such thing. When I made my corporate logos, I had to go take pictures of corporate logos to put them on the film, all right? This is how fast things have come. Yeah. Right? There was no Google image. There was I couldn't just drag and drop it. No, that didn't happen. That didn't exist. So uh, I was already talking about the cloning of mummies because this was a big deal for me. And I believe in the ancient past, the ancient civilizations of Atlantis and all that scenario, and that there was a high technologically advanced civilization living in the ancient past, that these massive monuments like the pyramids, the Mayan pyramids and uh, all over are actually global sized computer systems. They have all the same components. They have subterranean gases, gold, mica, uh, quartz crystal, you know, all of the same components that go into a computer are in the pyramids in bizarre ways that we can't reproduce in the 21st century. So there, I've studied our ancient architecture at Kansas University. I graduated with honors. I know what I'm talking about. We can't build the pyramids in the 21st century, all right? And much less Baalbek level. No. You know, you forget about it. All right. So there is a, a thing to the ancient past now. So we can clone mummies. They, they, you know, I, I suddenly found out Akhenaten looks exactly like Obama and said, oh, my God, I think they might be a clones. And then I found out that Michelle looks exactly like Akhenaten's mother. I split their faces in half. You can go look at this for yourself. Take it challenge. I have to take the Queen T challenge. That was Obama's mom. You can take Michelle's face and Queen T's face, split them in half yourself, put them together, and tell me if you can find which one is which because they're identical. Now, this can't happen. This is not reincarnation. The Obama family, all four, uh, Obama, Michelle, Malaya, and Sasha, are all identical completely identical to the cone-headed family of Akhenaten from 2,500 years ago. And we already proved that they had been cloned. Now, as I was announcing this to the world and making it known, I was making sure to, to preempt the moment Obama released the uh, federal funding on, on stem cell restrictions, because I thought human cloning was going to be on the lips of everybody, because here was the president talking about it. Come on. No, nothing, right? No one noticed. But the thing was, I announced it then. I, pre I actually released the story early without all the evidence. And they honestly did not have Akhenaten's DNA at the time. So here I was saying, I'm firm. I'm still standing on this. I'm still saying Obama's not going to leave office because he's a clone of Akhenaten. Akhenaten is the superior being to the Freemasons. If you go to every Grand Lodge in the world, and I have, and you can look at them in my photography section on my website, I've been to every Grand Lodge in the world mm -hmm. of Freemasonry, and they have a temple to Akhenaten. At the Rosicrucian Shrine, they have a temple to Akhenaten. Everywhere in the world, you, you guys talk about the Georgia Guidestones, made by R.C. Christian. That's the Rose, Christian Rosencruz, which is the Rosicrucians who venerate Akhenaten. Okay, everybody in this magical world venerates Akhenaten. There's a reason he would bring him back. He's, you know, but he wouldn't be Akhenaten, right? He would be evil Akhenaten, right? Because we'd already figured out that second chance wasn't chance and he was evil, right? We've looked at the AI too and, and all this, right? So it's not Akhenaten that's back, it's, it's Obama, you know, but he is Akhenaten's clone and the whole family. So as I brought this to the world's attention and said, look, I'm standing firm on this, they suddenly announce, oh, by the way, Zahi Hawass, the undersecretary of the Giza Plateau, who was yeah. fired for uh, taking sexual favors and bribes, 
um, and probably many other things, came, uh, he, he had a DNA lab built under the Cairo Museum using the Discovery Channel's money, $6 million to build this DNA lab so that they could find Akhenaten's DNA. And he suddenly, he shows you the KV-55 mummy DNA and says, we have Akhenaten's DNA. Now, this has been a mystery for over 100 years when they found Akhenaten's body because no one could tell whether it was Akhenaten or not. Half the people looked at it and said, that's a man. The other half said, that's a woman. Now, this hermaphroditic thing, too. Boom, right back into Akhenaten again. And, you know, the cone heads. Uh, you know, when, when Obama started losing his hair, we see these big old scars going across the side of his head. Maybe they had to get that cone a little smaller. Um, when you look at the ancient depictions of Malaya and Sasha, or uh, Akhenaten's children, Aksunamun and uh, Maritha Ten, uh, they have pointy Vulcan ears, right? I've got this on film. I had to sneak that footage for you, all right? I wasn't allowed to film it. I followed Anubis to Dallas, and I went to the Akhenaten display, and I secretly filmed it for you guys. And, of course, that's all in my Obama cloning article. So you can see that the ancient depictions of Malaya and Sasha, or Maritza Ten and, uh, and Asunamon, they have Vulcan ears, you know? So what are you going to say about that, right? Uh, they're identical, guys. I mean, and they have the DNA. They announced it. It's, you know, it, it absolutely is probable and absolutely possible. I gotta get my duct tape because I think my head's gonna explode in a second. <laughs> no, it really, um, it really does require a world where there is a Freeman to unravel this stuff. I, I'm just like, let me throw one more piece in this. Go for it. Before I had even done the Michelle Queen T Malay and Sasha, because the Malay and Sasha part was funny. We're sitting there looking through a Pharaoh book, and, and Jamie, my wife, says, "You're not gonna believe this," and I'm like, "What?" And she's like, "Well, he's depicted with two daughters." And I'm like, no way. So I pull out the two daughters. I mean, you got to go look it up. I, I could show you. But, you know, they're identical. And I'm like, no way. The, every moment was just like, oh, my God. So before any of that happened, I had done the Obama Akhenaten base half and half. And I said, OK, the next social engineering is asteroid fear. That's what's coming. So I made a picture of, of Akhenaten Obama with an asteroid hurtling towards his head. The next week, they announced oh my God, there's an asteroid hurtling towards planet Earth that's going to destroy all life in 2029 or 2036 whenever it hits. And this, uh, uh, this asteroid is known as Apophis. Oh, great. That is Akhenaten Satan. That is the Satan of Akhenaten's religion. And the, the asteroid that was coming, Apophis, that's the serpent deity of destruction of Akhenaten's religion, came from a group of asteroids known as the Aten. Well, that's Akhenaten's sun god. <laughs> and this stuff is blowing my mind, you know? I'm not, it's, it's just happening, you know? It's like, oh my God, this is too much. Well, it's what we were talking about earlier. When you begin to notice this stuff, when you insert yourself into it, you don't go looking for it anymore. It finds you. I'm. Yeah. I increasingly, I, am I a serious researcher? No, I don't have the time to do it. You know, I rely on people like you, my guests, to be able to bring fresh meat to the table just because I don't have time. But the time that I do spend doing it anymore is just intuitive. It's like, let me look at this. And then I wind up five hours later going, what the hell was I doing? What was I looking at? And I wound up somewhere else, but then it connects again. There's yeah. always like this this loop that gets closed somehow, but it went in a tangent that I couldn't have predicted if I even tried. No. Yeah. Um, and you know what's amazing for me, Randy, is everyone that I've been talking to and all the, you know, melu of what we look at, it keeps coming back to what you're saying, and that is the creative spirit of humanity. Yeah. The synchronistic connections, the divine. Yeah. That goes into this whole thing of reality creation I mean, we've got we've got these high wizards around us. We've got people that are clearly capable of orchestrating worldwide events. But at the same time, there's an X factor. Not everything that they plan and not everything that they do works out, goes on schedule, or flies straight. So the question becomes, how powerful are they? How powerful are we? And what is our role in, once we understand this, this information, what do we do with it? Yeah. 
I mean, look how much effort they go through to control our minds. Yeah. And that's what we're learning is conscious creation. And when you start to put your life in God's hands and do like I did and take a crazy walkabout, you know, just mm-hmm. go out there, put your life in God's hands. And, and, but you'll learn that there are methods that you must deploy and employ in order to understand and make these things work. I mean, if you go out there believing the world is, is heinous and coming to get you, it will. Yeah. Uh, but if you go out there with a light heart, you go out there with friendship in your, in your mind and you become a friend to the world, then it uplifts you and carries you. And miraculous things occur constantly around you. And it becomes just a fabric of your reality. Most of the travelers I know speak of road magic. And mm-hmm. before we had the term synchronicity, before the Celestine prophecies came out, we didn't, you know, we're just like, I don't know, man, I can't believe this happened. How did it happen? You know, just the right thing at the exact right moment. And here's the key ingredient is we're constantly being fed with uh, propaganda that tells us what the future will hold. Now, concepts like what Disney will do. Now, Disney for 50 years or whatever uh, has been showing you on, on Space Mountain after they traumatize you in the roller coaster, you're on this yeah. nice, calm, quiet mover, and they're showing you what your future is going to be. Well, guess who programmed that future in that storyline? Monsanto. Yes, that is correct. You know, it's Disney Monsanto. They're hand in hand. It was Disney that brought Monsanto to the surface to the world at the World's Fair. Um, you know, and they've been programming that into people for years and years without them not having any idea that this is occurring that they're being told what their future is and what it should be. And we're, you know, here we are witnessing it. But look at the blowback we've got now on Monsanto. I mean, they're being kicked out of, they're being kicked out of countries regularly now. Right. People are starting to wake up to this. And well, yeah, I don't think they knew we were going to turn this thing on them. I didn't think, I don't think they knew that I've, we would sit here and do all this crap for free. <laughs> you know, I've often wondered because, you know, clearly they gave us the internet. But they gave it to us for one thing, and we turned it around and used it for something else to the point where now mainstream media, the MSM, is being disempowered on such a, a level that they've, they've now resorted to, well, that's just an internet meme. That's what the alternative media is saying. It is a defensive posture that you're seeing from mainstream media because they're seriously threatened by this. There are people that have turned off their damn TVs they go watch YouTubes. They communicate with friends. They're starting to understand this whole dynamic. And so all of a sudden, you know, you can't pull off another 9-11 anymore. You know, we're watching things play out, but at the last minute, they're, they're being pulled back from the oh, air. Man. Sandy Hook. That yeah. was, oh, my God. Yeah. Murdered. Murdered live on the air, you know. I we, mean, we were watching. I mean, the story was murdered, not the children. Yeah. If, if you were watching YouTube, you wouldn't even believe a children was shot. There was zero evidence, and everybody was proof. No evidence at all. And they were on it. And I, mean, I actually... Crisis actors, here's, you know, we were on it. I was actually blogging that real time then. That was the last time I did that, because there was the uh, Aurora, Colorado shooting, the Batman shooting, mm-hmm. which I did extensive research into, uh, working with a, a, a Canadian investigator, um, John Kelly. Have you ever heard of him? He does uh, he's a UFO researcher. Okay. And he put me on to this time manipulation thread that was running through these guys. The uh, Jared Loeffner mm-hmm. um, was into this time manipulation thing. Yeah, was, yeah, he was working with DARPA. Yeah. We'll see the whole thing about it became this concept of time manipulation. Now we're back to time travel again. Exactly. Which goes into mind control. And when you began to look at Jared Loeffner and you began to look at um, the Batman shooting and then Sandy Hook as well. And I got to tell you something. I got through the Aurora shooting. I melted down physically and mentally right. for days. I just, I came unhinged. Right. Because I went, what the hell do you do with this? Yes. Yeah, we get we get into all of that too, and and weird stuff. I just want to do a little promo for the book, just so everybody knows that we we set this up so that you had a tool to share this information with your yeah. friends. So uh, you know everybody can relate to something in here. Is the life of Walt Disney, 
whether or not he was a Freemason. Here's how your store aisles program. Is that a question? If Disney was a Freemason, I didn't know that was a we, question. We did, yeah, we dug very deep to, to yeah. prove that he was not because it's one of the main, there's a lot of, a lot of BS going around. But you know? what was he? He was actually one of the original uh, de Molay. Uh, so that's just the Boy Scouts of Freemasonry named after the Knights Templar, uh, Jacques de Molay, uh, which goes to 1013. Um, but so uh, he was original knight in the Knights, Tem in the Knights of de Molay as a child. Mm -hmm. But uh, now, Walt Disney Co. is a completely different story. Absolutely. Freemason, left and right. You know, the, Walt, the company, Walt Disney, is absolutely Freemasonic. But how did they get to the place where they were doing these these sexual subliminals in cartoons and basically um what gang raping the the mouseketeers and turning them into britney spears and all these mind yeah. control subjects i mean the stories these aren't rumors anymore we know what goes on in hollywood and we certainly can see the evidence of what's going on um with disney in terms of somebody like a britney spears um uh, What's yeah, it? even Loeffner, who was, you know, said to, to be sitting there by his yeah. car waiting to be arrested, you know, uh, he said, I don't know, I was in a daze. He talked with the man in his jail cell, giving all that information. Of Which is exactly what Sirhan Sirhan said. Right, yes. Continued exactly. to say all these years. So, yeah, Disney and Britney Spears, you can see the multitude of Britneys. You know, there was a number of personalities coming out of Britney, Britney including a satanic one that her bodyguard reported on uh, Montel that really freaked him out when she would speak uh, in her satanic mm -hmm. persona. But So, yes, Disney has been at the core of this. Now, realize that when Disney put out Disney on the front lines, this documentary about their propaganda films, that teach you things like save your oil so we can make more bullets. Uh, it has uh, anti-tank training uh, cartoons with Donald Duck. You know, it yes. has pay your taxes. Now, when, yeah, the Donald Duck thing, when he paid his taxes, that got more people to pay their taxes than any of the government campaigns ever. Because and most people don't know that up until that point, most people were not filing income taxes. No, it's not. Three percent of the population at that point in time was responsible for filing in tax income taxes legally. Yeah, it wasn't a crime. Even no. Donald Duck had to make the choice. He had yeah. a little devil and a little angel, you know. It's a voluntary <laughs> system. Do I do it or don't I do it? Okay, so in this documentary, Disney on the Front Lines, which I believe you can only buy straight from Disney, I did. Uh, they post that that weren't uh, uh, just Joseph Goebbels, Goebbels. The, the Nazi propaganda, uh, main head of pro Nazi propaganda, adopted Walt Disney's techniques to create films, to create the, the, the generate the Nazis and the Nazi youth. So it wasn't the other way around, right? The uh, Nazis copied Disney. So the subtle sexual signs that you see inside of the Disney, like sex, uh, entangled, you'll see yeah. that. Those are really just uh, triggers to get you to be attentive to the situation. The real story that you should be paying attention to is the real story. Uh, look to the Little Mermaid. She gives up her talents to the Black Witch so that she can be with this man. Uh, they tell you, Entangled, the, your mom is an evil witch just sucking your soul that you should really run away with the uh, rebellious thief and uh, that you're, you know, your mother's really a witch succubus and you're actually a princess. And the princess warrior programming is critical to this military industrial complex. And that's what you'll find down your store aisles as you see all the pink for the girls and all the blue for the boys. And of course it's all sex for the girls. You'll see even uh, alien hybrid dolls. And, and they're really com combining the monster and the child now. So you'll see monster high uh, you know, for the girls, instead of Barbie, now they're all vampires and werewolves and uh, yeah. aliens. And then for the boys, it's all military or uh, military intelligence, like uh, Spider-Man type programming. Uh, and of course, the great one that's going to come out, and I, I want, if you guys want to be a part of understanding the psychological social engineering, J.J. Abrams uh, openly worked with the CIA on Alias and openly worked with CIA and Almost Human, which was all uh, transhumanist programming. Yes. Uh, J.J. Abrams is now producing the new Star Wars, which is in conjunction with who owns Star Wars now? Walt Disney Co. 
So you're going to have the lead propagandist working with a known CIA asset, creating this social engineering campaign that will be the new modern Star Wars. So really, when you watch that, keep that all in mind. It really, you know, everything's gotten so dark now. The simple things like comic books growing up. I mean, we grew up, I don't know if you remember this or not. I mean, comic books that I read in the <laughs> 60s, there was what was called the comics code. They mm -hmm. adhered to a certain code. And if you look at those comic books from, I would say, the 1950s through the 1960s up to the 1970s, they were almost bland in some sense. The square-jawed hero you know, rescuing the hapless citizen, defeating the thief, and then going off to the, uh, the the Fortress of Solitude with Lois Lane for a long weekend. That was that was as racy as it got. But as the 70s and the 80s came on, these comic books went into real dark areas. All mm -hmm. of a sudden, we took Batman, and Batman became the model for the MK, MK Ultra mind control thing. I mean, that the Dark Knight movie, to me, was an MK Ultra plot on steroids when you looked at the whole thing, all the symbolism, the splitting of the personality, the the sudden irrational impulses of Bruce Wayne. All of this went in a very dark direction. Was no, let's not forget. <laughs> Sorry. I can't no, help myself. No, like Bruce no, Wayne. No, go, please. Bruce Wayne's great grandfather started Skull and Bones. You know, yeah. in episode 33, you learn that Bruce Wayne's great grandfather was a founder of Skull and Bones. You know, yeah, absolutely. Well, I do do a full production on the Dark Hero programming. And what you're showing and what you're talking about was uh, when Superman died uh, and Batman had his back broken. Mm -hmm. okay, this was Bane and Doomsday, uh, the, the arch villains. When that occurred, when Batman had his back broken, he was replaced by another character. Well, it was Azrael, right? So Azrael is, is one of the fallen angels listed yes. in the Book of Enoch, the lead fallen angel that brought warfare and all of this madness and black magic to mankind. So if you read the Book of Enoch, you'll know the story of Azrael yes. and his, his fallen angels. Well, that's who took on the mantle of the bat when, when Batman had his back broken by Bane. Uh, when Superman died, he was then actually turned into a clone and a number of other, he was brought back as five or seven characters. I don't remember now, but uh, you know, one of them was a clone. One of them was a genetically modified boy. Uh, so the new Supermans all came back as in this transhumanist vein, but Superman really lost all his viability and he came back in a black suit with no cape carrying guns. Right, that's in weird stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, so the military programming, all of a sudden, what did Superman need with guns, right? But they put him in this full merit military black ops and, and had guns. But the 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 character that sp that spawned from that scenario was Hell Spawn, uh, put out by Image Comics. And as you're talking about this, and people don't know, families, mom, mothers don't know, their children are reading Hell Spawn. Hellspawn was an, a military intelligent asset that was a CIA rogue killer. He was an assassin and he was brought to hell and then sent back to kill evil people to fill Satan's army. Okay, this is the comic book character, Spawn. He took over when Superman died. I mean, he became in the spotlight. And the very first episode you read in Hellspawn is uh, this pedophile, uh, rapist, is the, the villain. Okay, so this is what children are reading now. You, you couple that with Katy Perry's E.T., where she says, I want to be abducted. I want to be a victim. Fill me with your poison. You're a supernatural extraterrestrial being. I want to have a baby with you. Give me a super, and you abducted me, you control me. These are the lyrics of the E.T. song by Katy Perry. All of this boils back down to the Typhonian sexual magical practices that are channeling entities into our souls, utilizing this new technologies of fiber optics and computer generated uh, ultra low radio frequency waves as well that punch holes into the other dimension. All of this stuff is coming back in that very day. And these are the people that are doing it. The Golden Dawn Society created the cathode ray tube that became your television. That was designed to channel entities on the other side and make communications with the ether realms. That's why the cathode ray tube was built. And, you know, this is where our technology boils up from. You wonder why there's a bitten apple on your, your Macintosh? Is it, the, you know, 
<laughs> All right? Is it the forbidden fruit? Well, no, that's not what Steve Jobs says. Steve Jobs says it's the poison apple of the witch of Snow White. So which is worse, right? Uh, we're looking at this puzzle and these guys are not here for humanity's benefit. Yeah, Darryl, I'll just take a pause there for a second because <laughs> that, was, that was a tour de force. Um, you know, we really... I guess I've spent probably the last eight years in some shape or form screaming from the rooftops about us losing our humanity. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to, you know, when I introduced you tonight, when, it, when I was reading your bio, just this whole creative aspect. Um, the computers, the technology that we have now, the digital technology makes incredible things possible, but it unfortunately also is altering us. And I noticed this when I was doing a lot of computer work and programming back in the 90s. I was starting to develop uh, symptoms of attention deficit disorder. I noticed mm -hmm. that my brain was speeding up. I noticed I had trouble concentrating. I noticed when I was away from a computer for extended period of time, I was starting to experience withdrawal. And it began to kind of red flag me that there was something to this technology. Now we have the Wi-Fi. We have ubiquitous, ubiquitous Wi-Fi. We have these machines that we're putting closer and closer to our bodies to the point where Apple now has a watch for us to wear that has the full spectrum um, diagnostics of being able to track all of your vitals, of being able to track you. And the watch is just, in my opinion, the gateway towards what they ultimately want to sell you, which is just put the chip in. Is that where we're going? Is that what they want us to do? Do we have an end game or is this just, is this the gods playing with the hapless human? Have you ever seen the Masonic program chip? And they have yes, their- Yes, I have, yes. I'm very, and this is, this is dark and this- They have their little icon chippy. Yeah. <laughs> make it cute make it fuzzy mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean there is a masonic child identity program called chip yes. and it has been around for a long time I, I have one of their videos around here too uh and you know this is all just preempting you know pre-predictive programming setting the stage for all of this um yeah the more you look into this puzzle the more you find that these guys are in communication with interdimensional beings utilizing ritual magic and that this is generally what's behind the actions that they perform we're taught to think it's politics money these guys are beyond all of that they're above nations they're above all of that and they are absolutely practicing ritual magic there's no doubts there's no questions and uh, you know, we show this over and over again and how it keeps getting into the modern society. The, the city of Astana is the most progressive city in the world. It's near where they launch all the rockets to the International Space Station. And it is, uh, I mean, it's so futuristic. They're building an indoor city there and they have all the smart buildings and all of that going on already. This is far beyond. And people look at Kazakhstan and they think of Borat, you know, and they think of, you know, goat yeah. sex and stuff. Yeah. But this is the most sophisticated modern city in the world. And and if you look at it from the air, it is a pre-planned city. It's actually designed as a seal of Solomon utilized to bind spirits. Now, Solomon was known for his grimoire uh, mm -hmm. of controlling 72 demons to build the temple. Now, the Temple Mount's going to be another big deal. I got a 1013 site on the Temple Mount. I'm, I'm watching that date, all right? So 1013 is the date I'm, I'm cluing in just to, to keep an eye out for on the Temple Mount is, is the it's the day the Templars fell. Um, but so, uh, I lost it. 1013, the Temple Mount. Uh, that was the sidetrack. Uh, why do I throw those in there? That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, um, we're fluid. Yeah. We'll come back. Deep breath. Um, because quite honestly, you know, it isn't because we're losing it. It's because the density of the information that we're dealing with here is extraordinary. I mean, yeah. I find myself at times having conversations with people where I look at them and I go, what the hell did I just say? And they go, oh my God, you were talking about, and they'll go back and they'll riff through the whole thing because we're kind of, we're almost seamlessly now just putting this stuff out. But the brain capacity 
to retain all this in conscious it's like it's like you ran ran out of buffer in the computer <laughs> yeah exactly you know, you've yeah. got to go back and you got to refresh the memory buffers because we're really dealing with extraordinary information and we're yeah. dealing with a density of information that it's beginning to strip our ability to cope with it plus the emotional dark content itself i mean it's like like i said early in the show there are just times when i need to walk away from this i need to put it down i need to do something to discharge back in to the planet to be able to just neutralize the circuits because it is it's it's overwhelming well we know we're in a cage we know we're in a zoo mm -hmm. and we're bound in this yeah yeah we can feel it you know we're we're doing all the things caged animals would do we have all those same symptoms and we we feel that we're in a zoo and some of us like you and i randy have uh, maybe escaped our cages but we're still in the zoo and we're running around to zoo animals and we're going hey look you're yeah. behind bars and they're saying no i'm not i'm in my natural habitat yeah. you know uh, so we're we've got that kind of lone loneliness of, of running around with all the people that don't see anything that we talk about. And that's one of the greatest things I hear all the time is I, I don't know anyone I can speak to about this stuff. But I tell you, folks, try it because more and more people are becoming open to this. And I'm finding my deli guy talking about Zionism. You know what I mean? And they're, they're getting layers. They're getting levels. Yeah. So do it. Uh, go ahead and open yourself. This is the key ingredient for us. The friendship agenda. We need to socialize. We need to know one another. We need to start to find all these connections. And you'll realize what I wanted to say earlier was that the universe has a greater plan than you could ever devise. Yes. yes. And it will bring things to you that you would have never thought of. I would have never thought to be on a television show. I would have never done this. Right. And the last place I wanted to be was in front of this camera. It's just not me. Um, but I, I was me and I didn't know that. And once I- That's the funny thing about it. Most people like us are actually introverts. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, inevitably. I mean, this, and like you, it's not what I would have mapped out to do. No. But, you know, I guess we're given the grace to do the things that we're called to do and the things that we need to do. It's, it's almost like you're compelled to yes. do it. But talking to people, I mean, there is a base entry level for people that you can approach subjects that are just say out there. Yeah. And, and and with some people now, there's a lot of anger about the laws. People are starting to realize the police aren't what they thought they were. You know, I talk to people all the time about the law because it's a common touchstone. And people know that almost inevitably, if the law screws with me, I'll fight back. I'll go to court. I'll do whatever I need to do. And so they're interested in that. That's that's the opening door because they don't right. understand what law is, where it came from, how it operates, the mystical system behind it. Why it's is magic. there a bar? Why aren't li lawyers licensed by the government? Why do they belong to a British registry? What is the copyrighted code behind the laws? Why are, you know, it just goes on and on and on and it builds over time. You build a narrative that is a bridge into understanding some of these subjects which is really what you've been doing low these many years yeah uh, you know you get strange reactions and you got to avoid the trigger subjects like uh you know a lot of what's social engineering and you don't want to talk about identity politics and the trigger subjects and sometimes i try to just like you know something i i say wonder without fear right so if i came to you and said hey did you know if you play yes we can in reverse it says thank you satan perfect let's day i mean you can do it yourself try it you yeah. know reverse the audio and thank you satan will come out every time That's and true. i i think this is just an interesting tidbit of information you know what i mean i'm not saying anything i was, I, I was the kid that was spinning vinyl beatles records backwards to right. get me on dead man and revolution number nine they're not even tape recorders then now you can do it with a wave file on your computer oh yeah you can just download it and put it on and and boom you can test it well i've had people completely freak out on me when i bring something like that up and i'm not expecting that reaction i'm expecting somebody to go whoa that's really weird you know what i mean mm -hmm. but i've had people have total meltdowns on me cry and yell at me while you know and i'm trying to figure out their reaction and what i just did to them i'm like you know did i break something <laughs> you know uh do you know that barack Obama 
in Hebrew means lightning from heaven? I do, yes. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah it's space all over the place. Isn't that crazy? Oh, but, my God. We're, I just looked at the clock, and, and we're... We, oh, we're out of time. We're tick-tock, tick-tock, out of time. Um, Freeman, it's been the fastest two hours I can imagine. Uh, far too little time to cover everything. One more time, let people know where they can find you and um, what you're up to these days. Definitely freemantv.com. And I'm getting up the uh, Free Your Mind conferences up there for you to watch as well. A lot of stuff there. I mean, Excellent. I make that website thick. It's 10 years of databasing. So freemantv.com is all you really need to know. That's great. Thanks for coming on tonight, my friend. Uh, we'll do this again because we didn't even scratch the surface. Uh, again, next week, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will catch Roger Landry, the Liberty Beacon Project, and we will dogleg over into this show for the three-hour special. There'll be announcements coming out, and then we'll be back in two weeks with Chris Kaler. This is All Planet TV. I'm Randy Moggins. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Begin to look for it. We'll see you very soon. Good night.